Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on an introduction to one-way Mankova. As always, if you find this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I certainly appreciate it. Mankova stands for Multivariate Analysis of Covariance. So if we think of this in terms of comparing it to ANOVA, there is a multivariate component, so it has multiple dependent variables, unlike ANOVA, which only has one dependent variable, and we have at least one covariate. So a one-way Mankova has one independent variable, that's the one-way part, more than one dependent variable, that's the multivariate part, and at least one covariate. It looks at the difference between adjusted means in two or more unrelated groups across a combination of the dependent variables, a linear combination of those variables. So in one-way Mankova, we just have one independent variable. And that gives us one null hypothesis. The adjusted means are equal. So let's use the example of treating participants with different counseling modalities. Let's use one independent variable, treatment, and three levels. Cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, Gestalt therapy, and Adlerian therapy. So Adlerian, Gestalt, and CBT, each of those represents a level of a single independent variable, treatment. So the null hypothesis would be that the adjusted means for those three levels are equal. In an ANOVA, the null hypothesis for a one-way ANOVA is that the means are equal. And the reason we use adjusted means as a null hypothesis for one-way MANCOVA is because we have at least one covariate. So in that example with the one independent variable treatment, let's assume that we have two dependent variables, depression and anxiety. The depression score would come from a measurement designed to measure depression and the anxiety score would come from an instrument designed to measure anxiety. So they're two separate instruments, two separate sets of scores. And let's say that we have some sort of scale available that the participants were scored on prior to treatment that measures general levels of stress. And we're worried that that, that presence of stress is contributing to variance in the depression dependent variable and the anxiety dependent variable. And because we're trying to examine the effect of treatment, that variable measuring stress becomes a confound. It could be explaining variance in those dependent variables, but we just want to look at the effect of the treatments of the different levels, the three levels of that single independent variable. So that stress score is the covariate. We want to control for that score and just see the effect of the independent variable. So therefore we're looking at adjusted means. The one-way Mankova will produce adjusted means based on the covariate. Now after performing a one-way Mankova you may need to perform a post hoc test to see where the difference is between the levels. Now in the example I'm using of one independent variable of three levels, you would need a post hoc test because you would receive a probability value after running one-way Mankova. And let's say that probability value was statistically significant, less than 0.05. So you know there's a difference on that linear combination of dependent variables between the levels of the independent variable, but you don't know where the difference is. And that's what the post hoc test does. It tells you where the difference is. So you have that statistically significant result. You know there's a difference between the levels of that independent variable somewhere as measured in the linear combination of the dependent variables, but you don't know where the difference is. It could be between CBT and Gestalt, CBT and Adlerian, or Gestalt 
and adlerian. It could, there could also be a difference between more than one of those pairs or all three pairs. And that's what the post hoc test will tell you. Now one of the things we see with one-way Mankova is the question about why not just run separate one-way ANCOVAs. So you could build two one-way ANCOVAs out of that example I'm using for that one one-way Mankova. You'd have one one-way ANCOVA with the dependent variable depression and another with the dependent variable anxiety and they would use the same independent variable, the treatment, and the same covariate, stress. The difficulty with that strategy is that there's a loss of statistical power. And power is the ability to detect a difference that's actually there. A one-way Mankova is more powerful than two one-way Mankovas. So you could run both one-way Mankovas, one for depression, one for anxiety, and have a p-value greater than 0 0.05, a non-statistically significant result. So you would think that there's no effect of that treatment variable on the dependent variable based on that result. However, you could perform a one-way Mankova using the same data, and it may find a statistically significant difference on that linear combination of the dependent variables. Now there are situations where you may want to consider multiple one-way ANCOVAs instead of one one-way MANCOVA. That could be when you have dependent variables that are uncorrelated or highly correlated. Now taking a look at the elements of a one-way MANCOVA. The term one-way is part of the statistic and that means we have one independent variable that independent variable has two or more levels. So in the example I'm using, it has three levels, CBT, Gestalt, and Adlerian. These levels or groups are independent, and this represents a between subjects design. For one-way Mankova, you have two or more dependent variables. They are measured at the continuous level of measurement, which means you have either an interval or ratio variable. A ratio variable has a meaningful distance between the observations and it also has a true zero. So if we consider the Kelvin scale for measuring temperature, there is a meaningful difference between the observations on the Kelvin scale and a zero represents an absence of the construct that scale measures, which is heat. Interval is the same, except it does not have a true zero. So a good example for that is the Fahrenheit scale. The Fahrenheit scale has a zero, but that zero does not represent an absence of heat, so it's not a true zero. With one-way Mankova, you also have one or more covariates. In the example I'm using, there's one covariate, which is stress. These covariates need to be measured, just like the dependent variables, at the interval or ratio level of measurement. Now taking a look at the assumptions for one-way Mankova. For any inferential statistic, we're going to have assumptions. And our data need to meet these assumptions in order to proceed with performing the statistic. A violation of the assumptions could affect the accuracy of the result of the statistic. One-way Mankova has quite a few assumptions. The first is you need independence of observations. So no one observation on a dependent variable can be dependent on another. You also need to have multivariate normality. Multivariate normality is difficult to directly assess. So it's not unusual that we use several methods and look at those results together to try to determine whether or not we have multivariate normality. One way to, would be to look at the univariate normality. So the residuals must be normally distributed for each level of the independent variable. So in the case of this treatment variable with CBT, Gestalt, and Adlerian, that's three levels. So you have three distributions. You'd have to test each distribution to see if it's normally distributed.
And one method would be the Shapiro-Wilk test. And that Shapiro-Wilk test returns a probability value, a p-value. If it's less than 0.05, that indicates that we have violated the assumption of normality. If it's greater than 0.05, that indicates that we have met that assumption of normality. Along with Shapiro-Wilk, you'd also want to look at the skewness, the kurtosis, and the histogram for each of those distributions. Now again, that's univariate normality, and we're trying to determine whether or not we have multivariate normality. So we may also want to calculate Mahalanobis distance. Now Mahalanobis distance tells us whether or not we have multivariate outliers. So if there are one or more multivariate outliers, that could indicate that the assumption of multivariate normality was not met. So the results of testing those three distributions, the three levels of the independent variable, to see if they're normal, and the results of looking at the Mahalanobis distance would be taken together to make a determination of whether or not we have multivariate normality. The next assumption is linearity. So we need linear relationships between all the pairs of the dependent variables. We also need a linear relationship between the covariate and the dependent variable for each level of the independent variable. And of course, in the case of Mankova, we have more than one dependent variable. So we'd have to make sure we have a linear relationship between our covariate and all of the dependent variables. So stress and depression and stress and anxiety. And both of those evaluations would have to be for each level of the independent variable treatment. The next assumption is that we have homogeneity of variance, covariance matrices. And when considering covariance, it's not unusual to use the boxes M test. And this test is highly sensitive. So rather than being evaluated at a probability value of 0.05, like a Shapiro-Wilk test would be, it's often evaluated at 0.001. The alpha level is set at 0.001. So a p-value of less than 0.001 would represent an instance where we would reject the null hypothesis. The last assumption here for one-way Mankova is homogeneity of regression slopes. There can be no interaction between the covariate and the independent variable. I hope you found this introduction to one-way Mankova to be helpful. Thanks for watching.